We're here to deliver for the people of this country. Uh, all the excitement in all the lies, it's easy to lose track of what Brexit promises were made. What you can do is ask yourself, are you better off than you were seven years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was seven years ago? Do your wages still cover your bills compared to seven years ago? Is Britain as respected throughout the world as it was? Do you feel the UK is still as strong as we were seven years ago? And if you answer all of those questions yes, then I think you can end this video. If you don't agree, if you don't think that all the Brexit promises made in the last seven years have come true, then I suggest you watch on and you decide. Have we been unlucky or were you punked? Well, in my last video similar to this, I discussed the 350 million, the trade deals, controlled immigration, EU law, and a stronger United Kingdom. However, in this video, I've got another seven claims. The first claim, you and your family will benefit from a resurgent economy led by new and flourishing small businesses following the removal of burdensome EU regulations and red tape. This has simply not been proven to be the case. Analysis by Bloomberg found that Brexit is costing the UK economy 100 billion a year. And that's the number you've, you've said there, this 100 billion uh, pound number, which is- With the effects spanning everything from business investment to the ability of companies to hire workers. Economists say that the economy is 4% smaller than it might have been. Which is essentially that we think the economy is about 4% smaller than it otherwise would have been. With business investment lagging significantly and the shortfall in EU workers widening. And we've looked at other angles as well, so the impact on investment, which is well known, the impact on certainty has come through and really damaged investment in the UK. Um, trade as well is a little bit weaker, though it's not quite as weak as we would have expected. You'd expect that to be one of the key channels through which Brexit affects the economy, and of course migration as well. And that leads on to a sub-question. Did the UK commit an act of economic self-harm when it voted to leave the EU in 2016? Well, the evidence so far still suggests it did. The main takeaway is that the rupture from the single market may have impacted the British economy faster than we, or most other forecasters, expected. Current investment, business investment in the UK is about 9% of GDP, which is well below the G7 average of 13%. The evidence that leaving the EU has actually hurt business and the economy is overwhelming. The Centre for European Reform showed that Britain's economy was 5.5% smaller than it would have been had it remained inside the European Union. The final bit of this claim worth looking at is around flourishing small businesses. The evidence suggests that it's the small businesses that have found it the hardest to adjust to the increased red tape and complication to trade that leaving the EU has brought. This is because they don't have the resources to open a European branch, for instance. That 350 million on the bus? How could we forget that question? The UK Statistics Authority called it a clear misuse of official statistics, and it didn't include the UK's rebate, which brought the figure down to 250 million. We now pay 42 billion in the divorce payment, which we were promised would not happen. You're absolutely right, and this figure of 50 billion doesn't have any legal basis whatsoever. It's been manufactured, and um, it doesn't seem um, likely that there will be such a bill for 50 billion pounds. It's part of Project Fear. Health warning, don't believe it. Um, and, the, you know, we, ha we pay into the European Investment Bank, and so actually we're going to get a windfall from leaving. So I think that the, the scaremongering about having to pay to leave is just not true. We have a lot to gain, our best days lie ahead, and we're going to be enjoying the freedoms and enjoying the, be the benefits that we gain from leaving. <laughs> Thanks, Suella. We now export 267 billion into the EU, and with a tariff of 20%, we pay more to the EU and get nothing in return, somewhere in the region of 50 billion in charges. But no rebate, no access to any of the support schemes, farmers are without subsidies, structural schemes, and every homeowner in Britain was entitled to a renovation grant worth up to 30,000. Now nothing, but cost, stress, and paperwork. The lower economic growth, because of the lower tax, means we have spent less on the NHS than we could have done if we hadn't left. 
Claim number two, controlled immigration will lead to reduced waiting times for you and your loved ones. Remember that advert? That advert that was sponsored by Leave, showing the old lady who was struggling to get an NHS appointment, and essentially, Leave campaign was blaming Europeans. Well, this was meant to free up space in the NHS. In reality, Brexit has meant fewer nurses and doctors, with doctors and nurses leaving for abroad, causing waiting times to rise and rise massively. A recent Wales Online special investigation showed the true scale of the NHS backlog with thousands dying whilst waiting for a procedure. The controlled immigration that will lead to this waiting time reduction has also been wildly off the mark. UK net migration hit half a million in the year of June last year, which was the highest figure ever recorded. The graph that you're looking at right now shows how net migration has increased in the UK, driven by non-European Union migrants. The problem has partly been created by the Tory government being more interested in business than in families, and with that issue, a very low birth rate and an aging population. We're heading into the problems Japan faced in the 1990s, with the potential for a lost double decade and the possibility of collapsing NHS. Today, in this manifesto, we pledge 50,000 more nurses and their bursaries and 50 million more GP surgery appointments. We're going to tackle waiting lists in our NHS and how many hospitals are we going to build? Four. Four. Okay. Well, how many more? Not one of the new hospitals has been built and neither has any of the new schools promised as part of the Brexit bonus. And that takes us on to claim three. Claim three, excess funding that otherwise sent to Brussels could also be directed to education, meaning better prospects for your children. Are we starting to see a pattern? Let's start by looking at universities. Brexit has decimated both access to funding staff students for all UK universities. Cambridge and Oxford used to receive 483 million over seven years from the European Research Fund, also known as Horizon. Now they've received nothing, and Oxford City Centre over the last few years has lost huge amounts of income from a reduction of European Union students as well as general European students. This is simply because tourism has flagged because of the new UK policy of ignoring ID that's accepted all over Europe and only wanting passports. Only 25% of Europeans have passports, 75% have ID. That means that if you're thinking of taking a school trip to Oxford, you're not really going to be able to do that because all it takes is one student not to have a passport, and that's it, the end of the trip. So instead, you're going to look within the European Union. What about compulsory education? According to the Institute of Physical Studies, school spending per pupil in England fell by 9% in real terms between 2009 and 10 and 2019 and 20, the largest cut in over 40 years. There has been an increase in the last three years, which started before we left the EU. That will increase spending per pupil by over 8%. However, no plans in either party look to reduce class numbers from 30 students to 19 students. 19 being the golden number needed for the most effective classrooms. Ultimately, the EU had nothing to do with the long-term underfunding of our schools. It has, and always will be, a political decision and that is ultimately been by the Tories, and as I stated earlier, they're more business than family. Claim number four, your wages will rise thanks to better controlled immigration that will lead to less competition for jobs. Again, same pattern. If you really want to debunk this claim, either check your bank balance or look at inflation, which is the highest in Europe. The Trade Unions Congress, also known as the TUC, found that real wages, which is your wages compared to the cost of living, fell by an average of £76 a month in 2022 because of mammoth inflation. In fact, this inflation is so high, elements of this and certain products are suffering hyperinflation. That's an increase of 30% within three years, and we're seeing some of our prices double in a single year. Key workers in the public sector are now £180 a month off worse in real terms than they were a year ago. This is the sharpest fall in real wages since 1977. Now clearly there is a lot at play here and inflation is not simply down to Brexit. 
However, the claim that because immigration will be better controlled, you're therefore able to get higher wages has proven untrue in several ways. Firstly, immigration is going up. Secondly, the skills shortage from Brexit has driven inflation that has contributed to wiping out any wage increases people have seen. Claim five, your weekly food shop will become cheaper. Food prices will no longer be inflated by agricultural policies controlled by the EU. This is an easy one. Leaving the EU has not reduced food prices. It has done the opposite. In fact, it has led to repeated food shortages, something that has never happened before whilst in the EU. Leaving has added an average of £210 to Britain's food costs over the last two years up until 2021, or at least according to the study run by the LSE, Centre for Economic Performance. This means that Brexit has so far cost UK households more than £5.8 billion in higher food bills. Now it could be argued that everywhere has seen food price increases because of the war in Ukraine. This is true, though the LSE data takes account of this when coming up with its £210 figure. There are dozens of ways to impact food prices. Removing EU agricultural policies was never likely to dramatically reduce the price of your supermarket shop. Rees-Mogg promised cheaper food, clothing and shoes. The benefits of leaving the European Union, including cheaper food, clothing and footwear, which we will get when we are free to set our own economic policies. We could have cheaper food, clothing and footwear straight away. Clothing and footwear price increases pushed up the overall total this month. In July of that year, Aldi's back-to-school uniform set at £3.75. But in July 2022, it was priced at £5. That's an increase of 33%. Even taking into account the inflation, the set should be worth £4.25, so that's still an increase of 17%. So, importantly, if Rees Mogg had predicted correctly, the uniform set would be worth £3. This means, based on his own prediction six years later, basic school clothing cost 66% more than he promised. The number of the beast is coincidence, but rather apt. Tim Martin of Weatherspoon fame was reported in The Sun that Brexit would offer a saving of 3.5 pence per meal, but his pub's serving costs have risen above inflation. In 2017, a meal of soup and a salad from Aldershot Weatherspoons would cost you £8.35. Today it's 12 45 The soup with the bread rose some 63% from £2.30 to £3.75. And the Mediterranean salad with a drink increased some 44% from £6.05 to £8.70 with inflation. It should be £7.42. So, the only reason that could have happened? That Mog and Tim are lying sacks of shit who profited out of Brexit. Talking about profiteering, isn't it interesting to see how all those Brexiteers who own so many properties did really well out of Brexit? Claim number six. With less pressure on housing, younger generations will also find it easier to get on the housing ladder. Anyone trying to get their first home knows just how far off the mark this claim was. According to the ONS in 2020, it was around 7.9 times your annual earnings to purchase a home. In 2021, it's now 9.1 times. Nothing has gotten cheaper. Everything has increased in cost. Brexit bonus. And this one, unfortunately, claim seven is the final one. And unfortunately, the most laughable. Claim seven. Politicians, both local and national, will become more accountable. Unless you were convinced of the line between Brexit and political accountability in 2016, it's unlikely your mind will have been changed since. Over the past seven years, politicians have voted themselves and police extraordinary powers. Just have a listen to this about a LBC news reporter being accosted by the police. Uh, and I explained I was there reporting uh, on the protest. They questioned how I got there. I said, in a car. They asked how I knew to be there. I said, Just Stop Oil had put on their social media the evening prior uh, a warning to drivers that they'd be blocking the M25 again. Now, no sooner had I said that, and they mustn't have even spoken to me for two minutes, uh, handcuffs were banged onto my uh, hand, first my left hand, and I went to grab my phone with my right hand, which was immediately snatched away. And I was arrested for on suspicion uh, of conspiracy to commit a public nuisance. To stop strikes, to stop protests and push through legislation without scrutiny. They've limited the power of the Supreme Court and removed your ability to vote in Europe, as well as removing an actual constitution. 
Although one still technically exists with the ECHR, they're now looking to get rid of that codified constitution as well, which means they'll be able to pass any law they like. And at the present moment in time, this is looking very authoritarian. A bigger irony is that in Northern Ireland, Ireland has more say over Northern Ireland's legislation than the people of Northern Ireland because they have no say in what takes place in the European Parliament. In fact, with Putin's Russian oligarchs having been given passports because they're rich, they're more able to have a say in British politics and your lives than the average British person who is just able to vote. Money gives more political power than your vote. Last week, the UK slipped down the Global Corruption Perceptions Index, also known as the CPI, to its lowest ever score amid warnings of slipping standards that are being noticed on the world stage. The UK fell seven places to be ranked 18th in the world after the PPE scandal and breaches the Mysterial Code by Tory cabinet members. Embarrassingly, only four other countries saw their year-on-year -year scores drop by five or more points. Qatar, Miramar, Azerbaijan and Oman. The UK was also downgraded in the annual Global Index of Civic Freedoms as a result of the government's increasingly authoritarian drive to impose restrictive and punitive laws on public protests. The UK's willingness to clamp down on civic freedoms such as the right to peaceful assembly means it's now classified as obstructed, putting it alongside countries such as South Africa, Hungary and Poland. And there you have it. As I stated earlier, there are seven claims here and in a previous video, there are another five. It's really interesting to see the total number is the unlucky number 13. Make of that as you will. And yet it's not all doom and gloom. There are still plenty of outlets and there's still the ability to vote. Although even that has been suppressed by this government in terms of voter ID. What I encourage everyone to do is get out and vote. And that means making sure you've registered to vote and on top of that, you've got the right ID that allows you to vote. This election is going to be more important than ever. We need to get this Tory government out at any cost. And by the looks of it, we need to get a referendum organised as soon as possible to get us back into the EU. If you managed to stick it all the way to the end, thank you so much. Please show a bit of love and appreciation for the video by just doing the simple and free things of clicking that like button, clicking the subscribe button, and make sure your notifications are always on. Thank you to all of my supporters on YouTube and Patreon. You keep this channel going and growing, allowing me to buy coffee, which keeps me awake at night making videos like this. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.